Princess Celestia the Changeling Queen, Chapter 18, Part 3 Syndra cringed and averted her gaze, unable to meet her mother's rapidly hardening eyes. I was scared for a hive and for you. With the attack on Candlelight, you have seemed to come mad. I saw your actions only made it harder for our infiltrators to gather love, and I've also lived with ponies for five years. I have seen their military power when their anger is provoked, their strength and unity. And admittedly, I didn't see why they deserve to be attacked. Maybe we would have won the war, but the cost would have been far too high. Thus, I wanted to do anything, anything I could do to save you and your hive from the anger and rage that the ponies would bring. If giving the information would end a possible war earlier by perhaps forcing you to surrender due to your infiltrators being discovered, then I was willing to give it. Chrysalis's eyes narrowed, her rage subsiding, only to be replaced by thinly suppressed fury and disappointment. As if sensing her rage, Celestia trotted forward to face the Changeling Queen. You have to understand, Chrysalis, from your daughter, I was able to discern more about your current state of mind. She told me about your foresight, loyalty, and love for your hive, but also about your shrewd nature. Thanks to her information, I was able to understand that perhaps you were not as mad as I thought you were. Her testimony and the evidence I found of your changeling starving were crucial. That convinced me that you may have had legitimate reasons for attacking Canterlot. Without that, I never would have approached you personally and we'd be at war. As Celestia finished, Chrysalis stayed silent, trying to consider the choices in her mind. Though the Queen's features were locked into a silent glare, Chrysalis's heart was torn. Celestia's actions were understandable, and though they frustrated Chrysalis, they were not currently on the Queen's mind. It was Syndra's betrayal that Chrysalis couldn't ignore, and the dilemma that opposed. After all, Chrysalis could see why Syndra chose to help Celestia. How would Syndra have known that her own sister had been hurt by ponies if she had no contact with her own hive? How could an exile realize the motivations that led to her sovereign to embark on such a seemingly foolhardy move? Chrysalis grimaced. She had to admit, attacking Candelot was not her brightest plan ever. But Chrysalis's fury could not be extinguished by simple rationalizations. Yes, she understood why Syndra had done so, but she couldn't understand why her own daughter had betrayed her. How could her own flesh and blood do this to her own family? What, what has she done to make the changeling that she loved and raised, rewarded and punished, turn on her like that? Were her actions so unreasonable that they couldn't be seen in any other light? The queen glared at her daughter, her grip too tight, a snarl on her unforgiving features. As she watched her mother's visage darken like a coming storm, Syndra's eyes widened. Her worst nightmare was unfolding right before her like a monster crawling out from under the bed. Syndra, how dare you betray our hive, betray me, after I granted you mercy! Chrysalis's voice was wavering from repressing anger, and her frame was locked in the vice of her control. One slip of control and Chrysalis wasn't sure what she would have done as vengeful thoughts ran through her head. But the changeling held back. Whether out of some last love or restraint, she wasn't sure. As Syndra's eyes watered again, Chrysalis shoved her daughter away from her. She couldn't afford to do anything else, lest she lash out with her anger. Yet that slight action seemed to break Syndra as she began to cry softly. Her daughter's tears almost made Chrysalis regret her decision. At least, almost. Leave now and do not show your face to me again until I call on you, said Chrysalis, a hint of a growl in her voice as she turned away from her youngest daughter. Yet her attempt to ignore the sobs of despair from her child only led to find Lamia blocking her path, a horrified expression on her face. Mother, I beg you to reconsider- She- Lamia, I will consider the fact that Syndra helped thwart my near assassination, but she has yet again broken another of the key rules of our species and endangered our hive. And this time, she did so willingly, knowing the consequences. I cannot overlook this, said Chrysalis harshly, allowing just a hint of the fury that she felt to slip out. Without another word, Chrysalis strode past her frozen daughter. Her eyes narrowed, hoof steps clicking decisively against the stone floor. Chrysalis walks right up to Celestia and thrust her hoof into the eloquent's face. And you, Princess Celestia? I accept the rationale behind your actions, but let me make this clear. I do not like what you did, and if you didn't have such a good reason for doing so, I would rip your throat out! Snarled Chrysalis. Celestia only dipped her head in assent, not even flinching at the Queen's threats. I understand, Queen Chrysalis. With that, the changelings marched away. Chrysalis kept her eyes forward, but Lamia couldn't help but gaze forlornly at her sobbing sister. The next day... The first thing Chrysalis noticed when they exited the chambers allotted them in the keep was Celestia in shining armor waiting for them in the hall. After exchanging very chilly greetings, made only worse by Chrysalis' escorting platoon of chevaliers glaring at shining armor, the group set off to the dungeons. Throughout the journey, there were no conversations, only the stamp of hooves against the floor. A part of Chrysalis had wanted to ask Celestia on where she was keeping Syndra. 
Her anger at her traitorous daughter was far stronger, though, and so Chrysalis kept her mouth shut. The entrance hall to the holding cells was lined with stark white walls, only interspaced by steel doors. Each door had a shuttered metal window, and was interlaced with an absurd amount of holding and reinforcing enchantments. A minotaur would have trouble getting through those doorways. Duly impressed by the security measures of the ponies, Chrysalis turned her attention to Captain Shining Armor, and several other guards' ponies also present. A few of them were on guard duty, the rest were examining and sorting the armor and equipment on a table far away from the prison cells. Captain, anything to report? Asked Celestia. Shining Armor snapped a quick salute and bowed in a rather apologetic manner to Chrysalis, before turning his attention back to the items. Yes, your highness. So far I've concluded several things about the assassins from the equipment that they have carried. Said Shining Armor, his tone uncharacteristically grim and his brow furrowed. Chrysalis frowned. This was a visage very different from the Shining Armor she had hypnotized during the royal wedding. First of all, these assassins are likely a small organization, and probably not extraordinarily expansive. Said Shining Armor. Celestian Chrysalis nodded out of no small relief, but that was abruptly shattered as the captain's countenance darkened. Enjoy that, because that's the only good news I have. We're dealing with a small, concentrated, and disciplined cohort of ponies probably linked to the lower rungs of the military hierarchy. Some of them are definitely military or in the militia. Shining Armor took a deep breath and paused, as if he couldn't stomach the words that he was about to say next. The assassins were part of a trained and coordinated paramilitary organization who has a vendetta against your hive, Queen Chrysalis. No pony or changeling moved, and for a moment, there was silence. That was until Chrysalis snarled, her sharp fangs gleaming wickedly in the light. Let them come and they will perish one by one, said the changeling queen, every syllable, every word cutting through the cool air like a keen-edged knife. Chrysalis, no pony is going to come and kill you or your hive said Celestia in a tone that brooked no argument. Chrysalis groaned in disappointment. It looked like Celestia was going to step in for her little ponies yet again. She should have known better. Thus, it was a shock to Chrysalis when the cool air in the windowless room suddenly became uncomfortably warm. Because we are going to find out who they are, and we are going to punish them for what their foolishness nearly brought about. Celestia's declaration echoed throughout the chamber like a tidal wave. Its tone shook the spines of all present in the room, pony and changeling alike. The words slammed into the heart of every chevalier and guard, rocking them to the innermost core. Chrysalis wasn't scared, but she was really surprised at Celestia's unexpected anger. She hit it, though. Captain Armor, have you made your conclusions regarding the paramilitary organization that tried to assassinate Chrysalis? Demanded Celestia. Shining Armor took a moment to recover from Celestia's declaration, before he switched to the professional demeanor representative of his position as captain of the Royal Guard. We can tell that from the armor and weapons. The armor's Mark 42 battle and ceremonial armor that came into use 30 years ago. Before production was stopped 20 years ago, the Mark 42 was the primary ceremonial and battle armor for our Royal Guards. But it's now designated for the Equestrian Militia and Royal Reserves. All the armor sets show signs of previous use. The fact that they are using out-of-date armor only available in our reserve units means that our organization needed to be one linked with the lower rungs of the military. That type of administrative power would provide them with a more antiquated armor and explain why they didn't have newer equipment. Shining Armor gestured to the weapons. I drew my conclusion that the assassins were part of a small organized group due to their weapons. None of these are forged by the royal armory that equips our army. Note that the serial and maker's marks were filed away or magically wiped, which indicates of how prepared this group of assassins were. Luckily, it's quite easy to tell that the weapons were forged for private owners. For one, warhammers and axes aren't standard armament for our military units. Also, while all the weapons are of decent quality, they have dissimilar shape and size. Moreover, if you look at the steel of the weapons closely, there's a variance in the material of the weapons and the smithing techniques used to heat the metal. These weapons weren't simply plundered or scavenged either as they do bear personal markings. Shining Armor quickly levitated one of the bardiches. This battle axe has a self-made hand grip to help the user swing. The unicorn then levitated one of the swords with a bit of a grimace and gestured to some of the small marks on the iron guard. See the cuts on the hilt? That's the beginning of a kill count. Before Chrysalis could vent her fury, Shining Armor dropped the sword with a scowl of disgust. Which allows me to conclude that the ponies were likely military or part of the militia. While it's not so difficult to gather a small group of ponies who privately own weapons, it's much harder to gather ponies who know how to treat their armor and weapons, as well as a military-trained pony. Shining levitated one of the burnished chest plates of the Golden Armor. This is parade-grade armor polishing that's instilled in every guard and militia member of the equestrian military. He then tapped a spear's point, not even wincing when his hoof was pricked. And any military pony would be glad to own a spear polished like this. 
Shining Armor turns to the group. Admittedly, weapon and armor care doesn't mean the ponies are necessarily military, but the assassins made one critical mistake that was necessary for them to carry out their plan. But, it firmly places the members of this organization as military or militia members. The unicorn levitated an innocent-looking stack of white papers, and gave it to Celestian Chrysalis. What's this? Asked Chrysalis, confused at the numbers and figures on the sheet. It appeared to be some sort of supply report or receipt. However, Celestia's sudden gasp made Chrysalis spin around, puzzled at why the Alicorn seemed so alarmed. Captain, you mean that they masqueraded as a supply party, smuggling in their own weapons and armor as military goods? But the papers of entry and supply receipts were signed by military officers who verified the identity of these ponies as either militia or army members. What the hell were your guards' ponies doing, Captain? Demanded Celestia, her deafening roar echoing throughout the room. Your Highness, the reason the convoy of assassins managed to pass as a supply convoy was because they had the proper military identification papers. They were all actual members of the Equestrian Army and the Equestrian Militia, said Shining Armor. Silence permeated throughout the room, ponies and changelings alike. That calm was abruptly shattered by the slam of Celestia's hooves on the ground as she marched up to Shining Armor, her eyes blazing. That is quite the big compromise. Who knows how soon it'll be fixed, but with how big their military is, that's gonna be real difficult. Anyways, let's get on to our outstanding donators. Top donators, TacoCat598, Peter Coltard, J Tin Man, Darkside, and only one thing. Zar630, Raiden, Narwhals, Black Moonheart, Pastel Skies, Austin Rollins, CrazyColor557, Stu Hex, Will, Omicron Lyrae, Chris, Dospo, Delta Omega, Jack Hedge, Runescythe9852, Madman Stan, Leslie Perkett, Drake Love Dragon, Hunter Norman, Stephen Bingham, Line God12, Sorcerer Constantine, Hudzaza, Gonver, Michael Taylor Moore, and many more amazing people. Thank you all so much for watching this video and live life to the fullest.